All this week, we've brought you coverage of a joint investigation by CBC News and CBC Sports that, for the first time, collected and counted sexual offense convictions across all sports over the last 20 years. The findings? Hundreds of cases deep. At least 222 amateur athletic coaches have been found guilty. More than 600 kids victims of their offenses. Our rinks, gyms, stadiums, fields, they are familiar places where kids develop a sense of self, where many people volunteer their time and where others build careers. So how do we keep them safe for everyone? I'm Todd Jackson, Director of Insurance and Risk Management with Hockey Canada, and I know the importance of creating a safe sporting environment. I'm Lorraine Lafreniere. I'm the CEO of the Coaching Association of Canada, and I share in caring about a safe sports system. I'm Karen Kennedy, President of Boost Child and Youth Advocacy Centre, and I believe that by working together we can prevent child sexual abuse. I'm Don Smythe, Director of Domestic Development at Canada Basketball. I'm familiar with the challenges with the NSOs, committed to fixing them and making sports safe. We have had so much reaction to these stories and a lot of questions too. You've been sending them in. So let's get to question number one. My name is Tara Zeri. I'm the mother of a 17-year-old hockey player. The question I have for the panel is how do I talk to our son about sexual abuse in sport? How do we educate him? And what are the red flags we watch for as parents? Okay, so a few parts to that question. And Karen, maybe I'll start with you, if you can tackle the first part. So, so how to talk, Tara wants to know, how to talk to her son about abuse. Sure, well, there's important messages that you need to give to your kids. And they include things like, it's your body, you get to say, who touches it and how. You've got to trust your feelings. If you feel uncomfortable about a situation, tell somebody and tell someone you trust and keep telling until they do something about it. You know, it's hard to say as a blanket rule, you know, no touching because we all know sports and you know, I think of gymnastics. There's a lot of touching that goes on yeah. by necessity. Are there hard and fast rules that you, you kind of give to parents and say, this, this is what you're, you should just tell your kid right out of the gate? Well, I think the most important one is that touching should never ever be a secret, that you can always talk about it. If, if it's a touch that you can't talk about, then there's something wrong. Lorraine, the other part of Tara's question was around red flags, how to spot them, what to look for in coaches. How would you respond to that? Uh, the red flag for me is what I call isolating events. Anything that puts a young person alone with a coach is an isolating event, whether it's on social media and texting or off the field to play in the locker room. And so that's what parents should watch for and talk to their children about is the expectations in the clubhouse. We're great at the field to play, but we've got to talk about the clubhouse and travel and accommodation and make sure no one is ever left alone. Text, texting is an interesting side to isolation, right? That, that may not be first and foremost when people, parents think about that. Uh, you know, following, if being friends on social media, w would you include that in, in the Absolutely. pattern of behavior to avoid? We recommend no one-on-one -on -one communication on Messenger, on Facebook, on Twitter, on texting. Really, there should always be a person on the copy line. Todd, from, from Hockey Canada's point of view, when you, when you hear these sorts of suggestions, mm -hmm. are, are they written down, sort of hard and fast rules in the policy? You know, certainly uh, as we've built our, our information, we have put tips in. And we actually have a parent guide on our website at, at hockeycanada.ca. And in that parent guide, uh, there, are, there are answers, I think, to some of the questions that, that have just been asked here. Uh, what do I watch for? What are the tips? Where do I go? And, and, uh, and, and how do I react to these types of situations? But, so but I guess, I mean, the, that puts the onus on parents, though, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking more along, you know, hard policy guidelines that coaches have to follow. No texting, no following on social media. Rule of two, you know, any, if you have a power relationship, I, you should absolutely. not be alone. There are uh, policies coming up all over the country with respect to social media, with respect to um, dressing room, too deep rule. Uh, those are all really important steps and, and uh, you know, that education pillar is so, so important in getting that to the coach's hands. and, and that way setting those expectations. Don, I'm going to let you jump in here, but, but sure. first I, I want to hear, there's another question here. This is actually from Tara's son, Stieg. Have a listen. Hello, my name is Stieg Zeri, and I'm a 17-year-old hockey player and golfer. My question is, what should I do if I'm ever in the situation with an abusive coach? And what should I do to follow up this scenario? You can speak from Canada Basketball's sure. point of view. 
what is what is the rule in place when an athlete encounters a situation that that he or she feels is inappropriate or abusive yeah i think it's really important for them to get into action right away and so uh to trust their feelings trust their gut uh and to get to start reporting um and so reporting that could, to whom yeah so that could be anyone from their parents it could be anyone from anyone within the club association i mean from canada basketball's perspective canada basketball is always there for our members and if um, they need to turn to anyone they can absolutely turn to us as well as our provincial and territorial organizations, but I think that the purpose and the, the first step is to actually just get in contact. There's, there's another question that we got and, and it very much relates to the process that unfolds. Have a listen. My name is Kira McCormack and I'm a former professional soccer player from Vancouver. My question is directed to the NSOs and it's do you think that you are able to fairly investigate yourselves um, in cases of sexual misconduct by your members without there being some kind of a conflict of interest and um, do you even think that it's fair that the onus should be on you to do so? Don, maybe you can start us off on that one. I mean this idea of yeah. reporting internally. I think, uh, I mean, we have policies on place uh, that's on our website at basketball.ca and we actually put together an outside committee to actually take care of it. So it's not done within this full-time staff or, you know, anyone who's around that coach. It's being put to a committee um, that's been appointed that's outside of the NSO so that it's actually very fair and arbitrary in order to deal with it um, and uh, get to a resolution. But this, this is a committee that's appointed by whom, right? Because, yeah. there, I mean, there can still be a conflict there. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, the intention to create it is to have no conflict. I think at the end of the day, as an NSO, we want to solve. We do not want this uh, for our athletes. Uh, we do not want this in, a, in our sport. Sure, Sorry, just to jump sure. in, it's actually much simpler than that. Any suspicion of child sexual abuse um, of a child 18 or under mm -hmm. has to be reported to the authorities. So before it gets to that point, it really, it's just tell somebody you trust get that person to do something, um, make that call to a child protection agency or police, and then depending on what the outcome is, then your process comes in. But the Absolutely. very first step is making that call to report it. Lorraine, I mean, just on the, the question, I mean, ought there to be a, a third party entity that, that is always in place to, to address these sorts of complaints? Yes, absolutely. We do need independence because people automatically fear retribution, whether real or perceived. So an independent avenue for a helpline, whether it's Kids Help Form, whether it's Children's Aid, is really important to help the system stay transparent and accountable. So um, I do think these internal mechanisms are also important because it helps the organization to understand what's going on, get a baseline, and if they deal with it effectively, they get to correct the behavior and fix the situation so they eliminate it from their sport. So it's a balance of both. And, but who pays for all of that? I mean, to, to set up a, a whole infrastructure around that? I think that is what the system is currently wrestling with completely. Uh, we do have some provinces, uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, that actually have helplines in place. We, the Coaching Association of Canada, have a partnership with Kids Help Phone, so we contribute to that organization in exchange for support. Uh, we work with the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. There are so many existing agencies, uh, child welfare, child support agencies, that we can partner with these people, but there is a gap in the system and we do need to address it. So, so anytime you have a sort of power relationship, right, between a coach and an athlete, anytime you raise an issue, no matter how you raise it, it can feel like you're, you're, you're jeopardizing everything you've invested, everything that you've, all the work that you've put into it, that, that you may compromise the relationship somehow by raising an issue. And the less egregious the offense becomes, the harder the question is, right? An athlete has to ask this impossible question of themselves. I mean, is this worth raising? Mm -hmm. You, any any good it? coach, though, it wants to make sure that their athlete performs in their best ability. And if they're doing something that's making an athlete uncomfortable or not being able to perform at that, that level, any um, ethical coach would take that information and make those adjustments so that their athlete would be in the best situation for them to perform. So I don't think it's an either or. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say, I, I have to be uncomfortable in order to stay with this coach or in this club or in this situation. There's lots of clubs. We're in a big country, fortunately. Um, and you have a lot of choices to be there, and it's not an either-or. We have another question. This is coming to us from Jay about coaches. Hi, my name is Jay Bowes. I'm a father of two and a coach of, in multiple sports. Every year, we struggle finding enough coaches. It seems if you're breathing, we'll take you. 
So my question is, what can we do at the grassroots level to recruit more coaches to increase the pool of people that we're pulling from so we don't necessarily have to keep the coaches that maybe we prefer not to? Okay, so, so this is a real, a real reality question, right? Todd, how do you encourage coaches? You know, I, I think that we want to make sure that we're, that we're bringing coaches in and that we're giving them all the tools they need, all the resources they need to be good coaches and, and to know what is crossing the line and what is not crossing the line. Right. So, Lorraine, let me ask you about that. I mean, does it feel like a, a safe environment from a coaching perspective? And I, and I wonder if there's an anxiety from coaches about this sort of new era that we're, we're in, especially compared to 20 years ago. There is an anxiety for certain, and I think what makes great coaches even greater is when they embrace it and talk about it and be transparent about how they're working in a safe sporting environment. So the recommendation I have for coaches is don't shy away, uh, be very public in your conversation, walk through the rules with participants and parents, talk about what they should be expecting in the clubhouse, in the training ground, on the away games, and make everyone understand it. Great coaches become even greater when they share in this type of challenge to make sport better. We have one more question that we want to get to. This is from Shamir. Hello, my name is Shamir Kanji. I'm a coach and a director over at the Canada Youth Basketball Association. We serve roughly a thousand kids in Canada and the neighboring areas. Uh, I'm also a father of two boys, age nine and 11. How do we as smaller organizations that are run almost exclusively by volunteers, how do we assess where we stand with regards to protecting our youth uh, and where the gaps exist? So, getting it right down, right, to yeah. the club level and offering them the support that they need. Dawn, how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, we've got a, a couple of different things. I think um, the first is, you know, what we have about is a, a club excellence. And it's a standard that we have on our website, again, basketball.ca. And it talks about what are some of those minimal standards to become an excellent club. And, uh, you know, knowing that to clubs differ in different ways around the country and have different resources, they have um, something that they can measure themselves against. Is there is there more, though? That, because, you know, you think of publishing policies and guidelines and rules and suggestions yep. on websites, sometimes that's where they stay. First of all, we've got to provide easy to use tools. So, you know, I'll start with education. Uh, we started with an in-class type of scenario 15 years ago, we've moved to online and, and through respect and sport. And now we're seeing that grow in our culture. Uh, it's, it's part of everyday business. Uh, every coach is taking it, every volunteer is taking it in most cases. I, I think it takes time, it takes, it takes um, patience and not to not to wait till it's perfect to put something in place. Mm -hmm. What about mandating clubs to, to make sure that they follow best practices and best guidelines and, and for there to be consequences if they don't? Well, I think some sport organizations have done that and we're seeing governments shift towards making sure, just like they do with concussion policies, that they have safe sport policies across the country. One thing I might add here is Clubs need to think about it as not a pass-fail. This is not about I'm failing, it's about I'm improving. And you know, safety is not an endpoint, it's a journey. And so to keep that conversation alive and be transparent about where things are weak and where they're strong is actually the point to getting better as a club. Karen, Todd, Don, Lorraine, a lot to get through in a relatively short amount of time, <laughs> but thank you for your time, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, thanks for talking about it.